Good evening, everyone. Would you please take your seats? We are about to start. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for again braving traffic. Thank you for everything that you had to do, whether it is a sitter, whether it is coming in from work to spend time with us on this important topic. Thank you and welcome to Garfield High School. Would you please give Dr. Terrence Hart, would you please give Dr. Terrence Hart and all of the Garfield family a round of applause for the use of this facility. We are greatly, greatly appreciative. Before we get started, I would like to introduce our interpretation team so that they can make an announcement for anyone that might need some additional service tonight. Interpretation team, would you please come forward? <laughs> Each one will make an announcement in their language and in our community's language, our top five languages of Somali, Spanish, Chinese, Amharic, and Vietnamese. Xin chào quý vị, tôi tên là Thúy. Tôi nói tiếng Việt. Nếu quý vị có tiếng Đức và tiếng Việt, thì tôi biết. Assalamu alaikum, Habayn wa naaksan, intakwa ala sha'af Somali, maghaigu wa mahamud, kadalpan fadiya, imara, mahatsanidin. Inda mina mishachu, ane hayla wu nha bala lo, ya maharinya astar gwa minan, ya maharinya turgum mtifalugu sa wach kala chu, ya wu taukumen, ama sagna lo. Hola, muy buenas tardes. Gracias por venir y acompañarnos. Mi nombre es Lorena Norris. Hoy voy a ser la intérprete para ustedes en español. Thank you to our team. Before we begin, it is important that we start with a land acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral lands and the traditional territories of the Puget Sound Coast Salish people. And again, welcome. My name is Bev Redmond. I am the Chief of Staff for Seattle Public Schools, and we are honored, again, that you are spending this evening with us for such an important conversation. I want to say something to you to say that I know that this is a challenging moment for our entire community. A lot of things are going through your mind. A lot of questions are on your mind. That this is a difficult topic but our hope is to provide you with some critical information tonight as we prepare to present a full plan to our school board. As we go on, I want to say that we also made some tweaks to our program to make sure that we had an opportunity to hear from you this evening. So with that, our agenda specifically, you're hearing the opening from me at this time, and then we will hear from our superintendent. We have a full agenda, so we will be taking most of the time, and if we go just a little bit over, we hope that you will certainly understand that. But he will be speaking for about 25 minutes in his presentation to us making the case for change, and then we will go into some sharing ideas and questions with our own Dr. Pritchett, and then we will have questions and answers from our senior leadership team, including Dr. Jones. We will be here answering many of your questions. 
I'm going to bounce back up to the sharing ideas and questions area. One of the things that we heard on Tuesday is that one, you wanted to learn from each other and hear each other, and then two, that you wanted to have a space where you can share your questions. We are going to do all of that this evening and make sure that when you leave, it's not necessarily about technology or a thought exchange, but it's about being present in the moment. Thank you so much again for being here. We hope that we have a robust evening ahead of us. Again, understand that it is challenging. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your time. And to begin our presentation this evening, please welcome our superintendent, Dr. Brent Jones. Thank you, Bev. So um, my goal, our goal is to really engage you all and give you information. Uh, Tuesday evening, uh, we, we had to make some adjustments. We found that we, uh, we had mismatched expectations from what we were trying to achieve and what the audience wanted to hear. So we made some adjustments. Uh, we wanna make sure that we give information, we give context, and then we get information from, from you all. And so that's how we've been trying to move throughout this whole process. And so I'll, I'll refer to a timeline a little later around where we are in the process. But uh, I did want to repeat something that Bev said. This is a challenging time for us. Uh, we're trying to figure out how to deliver the information in a way that it's meaningful, that we can all understand kind of where we're going uh, and what's being proposed on how we do it. And so. Uh, give us feedback along the way. Uh, our goal is to really be educators. And one of the things that we do as educators is we learn and we adjust so that we can make sure that the folks that we're trying to engage with actually have the right information and we do it in a way that's meaningful. And so if you all give me that privilege, that'd be great. And uh, know that we heard you last, last Tuesday for those of you who attended or those who you watched it, uh, we, we've made a few adjustments, okay? So, um, the board has given the superintendent, AKA staff, a, a directive to come up with a plan that's going to bring us stability. And one of the plans that they voted on uh, on May 8th was to make to give me the uh, charge to come up with a plan and a plan to bring us into stability. We're calling it a well-resourced school. And so today we, we do face uh, fiscal instability. That's not a, that's not a question. We are, in a, we are in a position where we have not enough resources to provide the types of services and programs to our students. We're experiencing a rising cost of living, and, and that's, that's evident not just in Seattle, but our sister districts uh, in King County. Our, our budget is not fully funded, and uh, many of us have, uh, have efforts and energy around talking to our folks in Olympia to make sure that we, education is fully funded. And we're witnessing a reduction in school age population in, right here in the city of Seattle. And, and we're, as a result of many things, we are experiencing declining enrollment. And our projections are saying that that's gonna happen for a while. So we are making progress towards fiscal stability. And we've had a couple opportunities to uh, get in front, of, in front of our board, to make some proposals around how are we gonna tackle uh, what's in essence $236 million over the last two years. Last year, we tackled uh, through our effort of calling it funding our future, we tackled a $131 million gap. And we did that through a variety of means. Uh, this year, we're, excuse me, this year we're looking at a $105 million gap. And so over the last couple of years, we've had a, a lot of challenge for us to really reduce the structural deficit. And so our board adopted uh, proposals that m my team and I pre prepared. Uh, they voted to approve those. We, we initiated our budget balancing process. We got our budgets balanced in 2023-24, and now we're in the 24-25 process. Part of what we did when we walked through that process is we found, let's, let's take a pause to make sure we're asking the community, what is a well-resourced school? And so, through this process of balancing our budget, looking at ways that we can reduce our structural deficit, we asked the community, what is a well-resourced school? 
and I'll get into a little bit of that in a few minutes, but that's where we generated this, these ideas on how can we create a system that's well-resourced. And it's gonna take a lot for us to do that, and you all know what's, what's on the horizon, but this is what we're trying to, this is what we're trying to uh, share with you all, a rationale for how are we coming up with this idea of well-resourced schools and what are we gonna do about it? So we are at a decision point. And I think the decision point is, is somewhat binary. And where we're, where we're maintaining a current system of schools right now, we have 105 schools, including 29 schools with less than 300 students. And just a data point, none of our sister districts have any schools that are under 300 students. It's hard, it's inefficient for us to be able to run schools at less than, uh, at, at, at 300, 300 students and less. So what we're, on the, we're on the path to reducing school staffing again. We're on the path to having to increase elementary and secondary class size. We're on the path to uh, have to eliminate preschool offerings. We're, we're also on the path to have to eliminate some of our extracurricular activities like athletics. And we're also looking at further reductions, and this will be our fourth year of reductions in the central office and maybe even curriculum adoptions and where we don't want to go is to have to renegotiate contracts. But if we go at this current pace that we're going on right now, mathematically, operationally, this is where we're going to, this is what it results in. If we look at transitioning to a system of well-resourced schools, we're looking at facilitating the expansion of our educational strategies. We can do more with less. Our schools providing an equitable mix of consistent services to more students. We're also looking at consistent, stable, and comprehensive school staffing. We've heard time and time again around October. October, some of our students have seen their, their favorite teachers. Some of our schools are disrupted by the October shuffle that's caused by enrollment. We can probably mitigate that with a, a consolidated uh, number of schools. Space for special education, intensive services, and pre-K in every building, that's what we can do if we think about how do we do this? How do we make this work with a transition to a, a system of well-resourced schools? And more, more, and equally as important, we want to have stable budgets year after year after year. We don't want to have to do the draconian measures that we, we've had to do over the last couple of years to get, our, get us to a position of stability. Instead, let's think about how we can consolidate our resources in a way that's meaningful. So this whole effort around a system of well-resourced schools is about stability and sustainability. It's not doing more with, I mean, it's not gaining more, it's really holding on to what we have. And I wanna be clear that Seattle Public Schools is a high-performing district. Our elementary schools are, are high-performing. Our teachers are fantastic. Our principals are doing great leadership and we wanna be able to sustain that. And to do that, I think we have to do it with a less amount, lesser amounts of resources going to our, uh, our schools. So what I, wanna, what I wanna say is, this is a part of a, a bigger plan, a sustainability plan. While we have school consolidation is a piece of it, these are all the pieces that we need to be looking at when we start talking about concepts like stability and sustainability. We need to make sure that we're looking at governance and, and having stabilized governance. We need to look at our funding. We, we're actually, coming close to being able to reduce our uh, structural deficit. Uh, we've had uh, one-time funds that we've been using to plug the gap over the last several years. Those one-time funds are gone. Now we are, we are left with the structural deficit that we're gonna reconcile. We need to make sure we pass our levies. Uh, that's, that's gonna be critically important. We need to make sure that we have a push in the legislature to make sure, again, that we're fully funding education. And we need to really start thinking about how are we working with our philanthropic partners so that we can make sure that the innovative practices that we have at all of our schools can be sustained. As we look at uh, staffing, uh, this is the one thing that we think is really important, is how do, we, how do we actualize predictable school allocations? So how do we make sure that we have routine uh, allocations of, of teachers, of educators, of, of critical professional school staff. Music, physical arts, and physical education and art are something that's not commonplace at every one of our schools. They have combinations of those, but they don't have 
music, PE, and art. And we've heard that from our, our tour around our Wealth Resource Schools engagement. Special education, having English language learner programming, expansion of highly capable access and mental health, these are all programs that we need to ensure are, are, have vitality and that they're well funded. And as we look at operations, safety is something that's tremendously important for us now. That's, that's part of what we're, uh, I wouldn't even call it almost an unfunded mandate, but that's something that we need to make sure that we're bringing stability to. Uh, transportation efficiency. We have to even look at how we're using our digital resources in terms of artificial intelligence. And then school, con school consolidations is one piece of the puzzle. It's a big one, obviously, but it's, it's part of a whole system of sustainability. So our current situation, in 2024, our enrollment is approximately 48,000 students with 105, 105 schools. As we look at how we're uh, serving our, our pre-K to fifth grade students, we're, we're doing that through 73 schools. And as, of 29 of these schools, as I mentioned before, are less than 300 students. And so our proposed plan will be to consolidate schools serving K-5 students next year in 25-26. So I want to pause here for you all to get a look at this. These are what's driving us in terms of our, our planning. The plan that we're going to roll out to our uh, school board in June are, is built on these guiding principles around making sure we have inclusive learning, special education and inclusionary practices, uh, enhanced services for multilingual learners, e expanding access to advanced learning, strengthening and stabilizing our neighborhood schools. We're looking at the building condition and learning environment. We want to make sure we're aligned with our projected enrollment. Looking at efficiency in terms of building capacity and service area capacity, and really allocating resources to achieve an equitable system. And lastly, we want to make sure that we're considering regional population dis density and equitable regional distribution. And so these are the criteria that we're using to come up with this, again, the system of well-resourced schools. And so I want you all to sit with that a little bit because this is, this is really the driving the driving force behind us to be able to come up with a, an enduring system. Complementary to that, we have policy 2200, which really speaks to supporting district-wide academic goals, placing programs and services equitably across the district, utilizing physical space and resources efficiently, and ensuring that our fiscal resources are taken into consideration. And so this is the policy framework that's driving our our guiding principles as well as our planning. And so when we look at a system of well-resourced schools, this new model will, be, will have fewer buildings. That's the proposed plan. Uh, each building's capacity would be aligned with enrollment. Schools will have more students, but will not be overcrowded. Our, the, the school size that we're looking at, around 400 students, that's not a large school relative to other, other other school districts. That's actually a mid-sized school. In some school districts, it's actually a small school. Schools not in use will be secured and repurposed until needed again. We're not going to be selling our buildings. We're going to keep them, in, keep them in inventory. So what it looks like that this is what a well-resourced school looks like. This is what, uh, when we went to talk to community around what is this concept of well-resourced schools, they, they spoke to us and said, we want multiple teacher, teachers per grade level. We'll talk about that in the Q&A session a little bit. That means teachers can collaborate and do things to really enhance the grade level services. Stable support staff. We don't want to see that shift of, of support staff over and over again annually. We want to make sure that we have inclusive learning for every student. That's something that we pride ourselves in Seattle around our special education services. We also have social emotional learning support, making sure we have a robust mental health support for our students. As I mentioned before, art, music, PE teachers, and having stabilized operational budgets, safe and healthy, beautiful school grounds, and make sure that our schools are neighborhood schools and they have connections to the community. So what we're talking about stability we're talking about staffing in this, in this context. 
when we look at a school that has 165 students that's on the left versus a school that has 515 students you can see the distri distribution of staffing and these are actual uh, schools in Seattle Public Schools right now. So if you look from the left to the right, you'll see that the, the, the larger schools have more staffing. And so, uh, for example, if you look at the social emotional learning support, you have one counselor or one social worker per school. If you go across to the 230 and 165 uh, person schools, they only have a half a counselor or half a social worker. And so we want to make sure that we have complete, comprehensive staffing. Again, we think we can do this when we consolidate our schools. So uh, another way to look at this, we have approximately 23,000 K-5 students in 23-24, served at more than 70 sites, 74 sites, 73 sites rather. The current site utilization is 65%. If we look at the transition to a system of well-resourced schools for 25-26, K-5 students would be better accommodated in approximately 50 sites. And so this projected site utilization would be about 85%, and that would be consistent with our middle schools and high schools. So why is school consolidation? Uh, too many schools serve our youngest scholars that are under-enrolled. Uh, empty seats can lead to fewer staffing resources and more staffing adjustments. Empty seats can lead to inequitable offerings from school to school. If we maintain the status quo, we will need to reduce services. So I think it's, I don't know if I'm making the case to you all or not. I don't have another plan that's more comprehensive for where we can go. But I think the case, case is that we're, we're challenged with trying to provide consistency predictability, reliability, and sustainable programs and services. So here's the timeline. Here we are, we, on the May, May 6th, we, we talked to the board around, here's, the plan, here's what we're proposing to, to move forward. We made the business case on May 8th, and here we are right now with staff community in, information sessions. Uh, in June 3rd, our, we have our board agenda, but June 10th is where we're, we're aiming to have the preliminary uh, recommendation to the board. After that, we'll have public reviews. We'll have uh, the board will need to approve a package. The super, superintendent's recommendation will be to the board sometime in uh, September, I believe. And then we'll have another 14 day review. So there'll be other times for us to engage with you around this. Uh, we are open to feedback. We are open to your, your guidance around what we need to do. But it's, this is a challenge in front of us. And so, in, in closing on this piece, bottom line is every student deserves a well-resourced school. I think we all agree with that. Uh, how we get there is where we might have some dissonance, but I think we all want to see our students have well-resourced schools. And so, uh, as I mentioned to the, the folks at Roosevelt on Tuesday, I'm with you all on this. I understand how difficult this may be. I understand there's, there's different perspectives I understand where people don't want to go, but we have to, we're disrupting business and we're going to replace it with something better. And we all need to come together as a community on how we do this. And so if there's a way to do this differently in a comprehensive manner, let's talk about it. But I think that the, the way that we need to move right now is to think about moving from 70, 73 schools to something less than 73 schools, probably about 50 schools. And so to, as we move together, Let's stay informed. Let's, I, I was personally impacted by school closures as a kid. I moved four times for, uh, from, from busing from the south end to the north end to my school being closed. I, I get it. My parents had to do all kind of stuff to make sure that we got a good education. But my education was unparalleled, unsurpassed in Seattle Public Schools because my teachers cared, my principals cared. I think we can bring that ethic of care as we walk through this, these changes. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close now, but I'd like to uh, invite my, my team up to have some questions and answer sessions with you all. Uh, again, on Tuesday, as we, we were challenged be, because we didn't meet the expectations of the, of the audience, this is our opportunity to have a redo, if you will, and get, a, get your input, get your feedback. Um, I think there's some, some cards on the table, and I think uh, either 
Dr. Pritchett, please tell us how we're going to make this happen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Jones. For this next part, as Chief Redman um, alluded to, we've made some changes um, between uh, Tuesday and today. We're going to ask you to do a couple things. We have note cards on the tables. We have pens on the tables. We're going to ask that we take a few minutes for you to think about questions that you may have that you would like our senior staff to answer. Um, we, will we will gather those cards. We will be sorting those so that then we can get to our panel part of it. Before we go to our panel part, and once we give about three minutes for you to write, jot down questions that you'd like us to do, we'll have some runners that are coming around. If I can have some of those folks kind of wait, raise their hand. As you get finished with your cards, if you could please um, kind of hold them up so that we can get those and collect those so that we can have um, those questions ready for our panel discussion. We're also gonna have some tabletop discussion and we're kind of situated in clusters. We have facilitators that are sitting um, within these clusters of tables. Um, some of them have introduced themselves to you, but we're gonna also ask you to think about as you listen to our presentation today, what resonated with you in the conversation that we had with Dr. Jones, what resonated, but what, what, is, what are also things that you would like to know more about? And so we're going to do a little bit of time talking about that within the table, and then we're going to transition to the panel who are going to start answering some of the questions that you've written down on note cards, okay? If you have your note cards already ready and if you have your questions, certainly you can have folks. We'll start gathering those. But I will go ahead and give us about three minutes so that everybody has an opportunity to answer questions. As we get to that three minutes, I'm going to signal for our facilitators to then be working with you and talking with, within the table clusters around, again, one thing that resonated, what are some of the other things that you'd like more information on, okay? And so I'm gonna go ahead and get that started with that three minutes for people just to be able to write their questions and their note cards. If you do not have a note card for some reason, um, please let us know we have more. If for some reason you don't have a pen at your table, we can certainly get that as well. Again, as you finish with your cards, please Raise your hand up just a little bit so that we can gather those. Okay? Thank you. All right, let's take about one more minute to 
get questions. Facilitators, if we can start with our cluster groups, our table groups. Again, if we can take a few minutes to talk about what has resonated in the presentation and what are additional things that you'd like to hear about? What is additional information that you would like to hear? And we're gonna take about 10 minutes for this. Facilitators, if you have not started, please start with your table clusters. Again, what are things that resonated and what would you like to have more information about?
just want to give a two minute, two minute warning for our facilitators. We have about two more minutes of this portion of our program. Again, two more minutes. I'm going to ask our senior leaders who are a part of the panel to start making their way up. I know it's always awkward to, to cut people off in the middle of conversation. We've had a lot of opportunity to have some good conversations at our tables. Thank you to our facilitators. Thank you to our community members. As we wrap up this portion of our agenda, we're gonna to start to move into our panel discussion. So as you wrote questions, we've collected questions. We've dedicated about 30 minutes to this part of our presentation tonight. As I'm gonna say one more, just quickly, we have about 30 minutes for this part of our presentation tonight. Question and answer panel will be about 30 minutes. As you may know, we will probably will not get to every single question that we collected. We try to sort and do some groupings on um, similar questions, what we're hearing. So we will continue to keep those questions. We will answer those questions. If we can't answer them this evening, we'll continue to use those as part of our FAQs and start to build those um, questions. Our FAQs are on our website. As we leave tonight, we'll give you an FAQ card that you can actually go directly to our website so you can start to see some of the FAQs that we've already um, started to build up. But I would ask that our senior leaders come up to the front, make our way to the front so that we can start our panel discussion. Again, this will be about 30 minutes of time um, to answer some of the questions that we received tonight. Again, we may not get to all of the questions, but we're gonna try and do a wide swath of questions um, that were asked tonight. And again, we will continue. 
Oh, okay, wait a minute. Okay, this is important. Somebody's getting ready to be yeah. told. Okay. So if you are the owner of a Navy Honda Odyssey uh, parked in front of the Teen Life Center, tag number BDB6365, uh, at this time, can you please move your vehicle? Uh, you are, uh, some um, cars are being blocked in and the, to the tours are coming. So please move your car as soon as possible. Thank you so much. Again, that's Navy Blue Honda Odyssey parked in front of the Teen Life Center. Thank you, Dr. Hart. All right, I'm, I, I'm coming, I'm, I'm coming. All right. Yeah, please. Uh, you know, this is uh, Dr. Marnie Campbell. She's going to be reading the questions. Uh, once you introduce yourself and learn what you do, and I'm going to have the whole panel introduce themselves, please. Thank you. So I'm Marnie Campbell. I'm a longtime uh, school principal and leader, also have been in the central office, and a parent of three Seattle Public School students. I had the chance to be my children's middle and high school principal at Eckstein and at Nathan Hale, and they're doing great, so thank you. Sarah Pritchett. Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources, graduate of Franklin High School, um, proud graduate of Seattle Public Schools. I've been working with Seattle schools for her since ooh, 1992. Um, all kinds of positions. Uh, Brent Jones, Hawthorne, John Muir graduate, Superintendent. Art Jarvis, Deputy Superintendent for Academics. Uh, Kurt Thettelman, Assistant Superintendent for Finance, a proud father of two graduates of Seattle Public Schools, Whittier Wildcats and Ballard Beavers. Good evening, everybody. I'm Fred Podesta, the district's chief operations officer. I really want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank all the table groups. And while you're all great, the, the people who are sitting at my table were the best. And so thank you. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you so much. And I have the opportunity to read the questions tonight. So again, thank you so much. And I had a chance to meet with a group in the back and I appreciated having a chance to hear from you. The first is uh, more of a comment than a question, but I thought it was important to share. Someone whose student attends West Seattle High School said, thank you for doing what should have been started years ago. Half of empty buildings, um, half empty buildings are not sustainable. So thank you for that. Next question is, how will this reduce cost? If you aren't selling the closed schools, how do you reduce cost? Will teachers or staff be cut? I'll pass this down to Dr. Buttleman. We can all answer this one, I think. Um, so with a building, there are fixed costs. Uh, your principal, office staff, maintenance, utilities, custodial staff, additional bus routes, um, food service workers all serving smaller schools. Um, that's some of the costs that'll be um, saved if schools are consolidated at the table I was at, which was also a very good table, Fred. Um, there was this need for more details on what those are. And so just as the superintendent is working with the school board on coming up with a formal proposal in June, um, please be um, well assured that more details on that will come forward. Um, in terms of how those costs are being estimated, the cost savings that are being estimated, but just the, the costs of operating a building are significant for a, a school. Um, and so those are the operating costs that are, that are being discussed as the savings. Um, there is not uh, an assumption that the $104 or $94 million deficit um, that's being projected for 25-6 is going to be solved completely by um, eliminating some school operational costs, but um, significant portions of that could be. So um, that's the, the general um, buckets of costs that um, would be saved in a school consolidation. Do you want to add anything? No, I think you covered it. There, as um, Dr. Buttleman talked about, we do have um, costs that will be that will be saved by reduction in staff. Um, he talked about a little bit of that around um, 
school leaders around uh, different costs um, with some of the fixed staff that are in buildings. Um, we hope that we can support staff though through, we have attrition that happens every year. We have some other things. So we're hoping that again, the bodies of folks um, that will um, be able to, uh, to keep as many people as possible. But yes, yeah, some of those some of those costs that we will, um, that we will achieve will be obviously through some of the, some staff. And one thing I want to share, um, a, a really key part, and again, we, we want to make this an upgrade, not just, a, not just a cutting. How do we build stronger, better schools and a stronger, better system of schools? One of the things we designed for uh, was ensuring that we have space in every single one of our K-5 schools for at least three um, classes for students receiving intensive special education services. And I, one of my departments is enrollment, and so I'm very aware of this right now only 43% of our students who receive this kind of service get to go to their home or attendance area school. That means the rest of our students are going to a school that is not the school that their siblings go to, that their neighbors go to. And I think about how we put a dollar value on that. I think it's, I think it's priceless. So when we're able to add more opportunities for students to go to their neighborhood schools, um, there are some other aspects that are, that are even more powerful. So I, the question is, why do we not ask the state to fully fund special education? Uh, we do. Uh, that is a continual ask. But we also have some work to do to make our services more effective and more efficient. But that is a constant ask. So a question from uh, another uh, community member here. Have you considered staggering the consolidation over three years in order to hedge against unpredictable enrollment patterns? Um, and again, I, I'll speak to this one since enrollment is my department. Um, we are quite confident we have um, triangulated our enrollment predictions, our own internal enrollment. Uh, we have two separate external agencies that have done demographic and enrollment studies for us. Um, we're quite confident that, that we have projected out um, and that the way potentially we have designed um, our schools with that 85% capacity, that we do have the capacity um, in case that there are any adjustments. The analysis will be shared, but that will be shared with our school board initially. That is the way that this process goes. Um, and we are, have run a number of scenarios. Um, staggering, again, when we look at this kind of level of closure, um, it, it is really dependent upon a full region. So we have to think about what are the elementary schools that feed into those middles and those high schools. So we do have to, in many ways, operationalize this um, in, in, in one group because there will be some adjustments um, in terms of where students are going. So I recognize that staggering it sounds like it might be better, but we do have uh, some interde interdependencies uh, that make that difficult. Will you be releasing a detailed line item forecast of the cost drivers that are expected to increase savings? So I think we've spoken to that. Any other questions about that? And I can just add, there's a lot of detailed information that the district tries to put out on the, the school budget and the process I brought cop not copies for everyone, but I brought my copies of the budget book and the purple book and the gold book. And those of you who are really familiar with the processes um, know what those mean about how school staffing and the budgets work. Um, today, we put the 24-5 budget book, the proposal we made to the school board on June 10th online, but always want more and more feedback on how the information can be more accessible and what information is needed so folks can feel that they've got the information they need as um, they're engaging in these conversations and decisions. So please continue to give feedback on what would make the information better. We tried to put some more summary level information in this year um, so that folks who, um, like me, when I was a busy parent with kids in school, couldn't digest all of it, but just sort of here's the Cliff Notes version of the information. So trying to make more information available for folks so you can engage in these conversations um, actively. Thank you. Next question. It sounds like more funding is needed. How can we help Seattle Public Schools pressure state legislators to fully fund education? And I'm going to let, yeah, I hear that. I hear that. I'm going to let the superintendent speak to that. So I'm, I'm going to ask you all a question. Uh, if, we, if, we come, if we come with up with a plan to uh, approach the legislature that's a nice, tight plan, would you all join us in trying to make that happen? OK, so, so 
we, we are, we are going to commit to doing that. We have other partners that, that are looking at how are we going to increase our, uh, our, our funding for our programs. I mean, from our, from our labor partners to our advocacy groups, we need to make sure that we're asking the right questions. And I think one of the challenges is, are, are we asking for too many different things or how do we prioritize what's, what's first and foremost? We know that special education funding is really important. We know that transportation funding is really important. We know, we know that our materials and supplies money is really important. What's our, how, how will we come up with a strategy? And I'm just seeing if you all are willing to join in that. I think that's gonna be an ongoing thing that we need to do. However this turns out, we need to make sure that we're getting fully funded from the legislature. So thank you. I guess my comment is I'd like to comment on the McCleary fix. The McCleary fix started bringing money into the schools just before COVID hit. So for the next three years, that was masked. You really didn't see the full effect of what McCleary did. McCleary did two major things that affect Seattle. One is they limited Seattle's ability to take care of its own problems. They said, this is all the money you can collect on levies. And they, I understand why they fixed that or why they tried, but they left Seattle without being able to fix its own problems. Secondly, they, said, they admitted that McCleary was uh, the prototype would need a lot of work. They have been otherwise occupied for these last uh, couple of years with housing and affordable housing and some other issues, and I understand that. But meanwhile, they've left special education, they've left transportation, they've left the basic ed prototype uh, untouched, and that's not serving us well. In case you wonder why, you're watching this happen in places like Moses Lake and Evergreen and Blaine and Mount Baker and across the state. Uh, it is the same issue that the funding system has got to be fixed. You cannot stop where they were in 2018 and then leave us where we are. I wonder who that was. I, th I think I recognize that voice. <laughs> Just as a point of context, and this is on the FAQs on the website, the K-12 spending in the state in fiscal year 2018-19 was 52.4% of the total budget, and in last year was 43%, so almost a 10% decrease. Um, so K-12 is not um, retaining its share of the state funding. Thank you. Our next question, um, how did you close this year's, uh, I think it's the Kurt show tonight, how did you close this year's $135 million gap? And how much of that is multi-year savings? Yeah? Um, the ongoing savings of the $104 million was about $29 million um, reductions at central office, um, a few changes in transportation, um, increasing secondary class sizes was a part of that. Um, some furlough days for um, non-represented staff were a part of that. So 29 of the 104 million was ongoing um, type reductions. Um, the biggest chunk of the one-time reductions is the school district is borrowing from its capital fund for next year, uh, $27.5 million to sort of have a quote unquote balanced budget for 24, 25 and so the district needs to pay that back to the capital fund with interest um, by June of 26, but the legislature made a provision um, for Seattle and other districts, as Dr. Jarvis is indicating, that are having financial strife right now where they could, if they had the resources in their capital fund that weren't going to be impacting the capital program, um, they could one time borrow that on a temporary basis. Um, some other temporary fixes or temporary solutions were in there too, borrowing from our um, rainy day fund for another year. Um, but um, the district's making progress. It went from 131 to 104 and projecting 94 into the future for next year on the, the ongoing deficit. All right, and I'm gonna walk this on down because I'm gonna, get, I don't know, we'll, I think Fred might wanna answer this. 66.5 million is allocated by Seattle Public Schools to redevelop Memorial Stadium. Could these funds be moved to keep schools open? Um, no, we're uh, making as uh, leaning on our capital fund. That again is our capital fund, as Dr. 
Buttleman referred to, we can borrow money on a temporary basis from our capital fund until we come to sustainable solutions. We believe the best sustainable solution is this transition to a system of well-resourced schools. But one way or the other, we're going to have to resolve our ongoing expen align our ongoing expenditures to our ongoing revenue. And that's all operating dollars that um, have to balance year in, year out. Anything we do on our capital fund, whether it's improving school buildings or replacing uh, Memorial Stadium, which is a 75-year-old building that gets used very intensely uh, by our athletics and ho we hope to uh, department and get used even more by many schools. And also um, uh, the new venue being a better place for performing arts, that is a legally distinct set of funds um, that we got from the voters and made a promise what we would do with that that money and we can't retool it to solve the general fund budget problems that we're talking about now. Uh, and then as as uh, no and and I understand the the curiosity about this but it, as Dr. Jarvis mentioned, in the McCleary fix, the state has capped our ability to ask the, the voters. We, you are, we are all, um, the voters always support our operating levies that directly address these problems, and we are um, leveraging that to the maximum legal amount. It's separate. We're still going to have football games. We're still going to have athletics. We're still, we hope, and we're still going to be able um, to support that. So that project and other um, school improvements, security improvements, HVAC improvements. We will, e even if we consolidate schools, we will still have many, many buildings and we will still need to make investments in those buildings. Um, but that is a whole separate financing scheme and you can't, we, we're not able to mix those revenue sources. Thank you. Thank you. I, and one last, I think somebody made a comment about the interest. We are able um, in the cash pool, where we keep those capital dollars, we are able to um, repurpose uh, interest that we earn on capital money that we have in the bank, um, in the county's cash pool to help us with our operating, and we are doing that. That is in the next year's budget, and we will hit that as hard as we can. Um, and we're looking at every possible solution to um, get to a balanced operating budget. Thank you, um, and we do want to make sure, thank you for that, we're getting to as many of these questions as possible. Will closures result in children being bused long distances? Will children be able to walk to school or are kids assigned to the closest school to them? So I can speak to that a little bit. We've done an analysis, uh, transportation is another one of my departments, um, to see uh, a potential with our different, you know, modeling out um, scenarios and students uh, do not live further from a put these potentially consolidated schools than they do currently. So we do not anticipate that students will be traveling much further. Um, uh, their access to attendance area schools will continue to be robust. So the question is, will they have to cross busy streets? So we have provisions for that. We actually have a, tra a student traffic safety committee that's a joint committee that meets with folks from the community, from the city, that uh, we, we do not want st students crossing um, arterials. So I hear that, absolutely. How much are we saving for each school closure? Between 750000 and $2.5 million per closure, but without sort of a formal proposal, um, we don't have specifics on that yet, but that would... So we're going to continue with these questions. Bear in mind that the analysis is going to go to the board in its fullness. That is the process. So, uh, Dr. Buttleman, will you um, just kind of break down what the cost would be for a uh, school for a school closure? What, how much we earn? I'm mean, just kind of walk through. Give them, give them some insight on that. In terms of where the savings come from. 
And I appreciate the frustration about not having the detail. What Dr. Buttleman is alluding to is the exact savings are site specific. And we're not, we haven't finalized on a specific set of sites yet. So that's why it's a range. And um, these conversations are about, you know, talking to the community about the, the considerations, the guiding principles that uh, Dr. Jones alluded to before we finalize that list to understand kind of at the system level what the community's values are. But we can't speak to exactly what we're gonna save until we have a specific list of buildings. We haven't finalized that yet. There is a lot of process left after that initial recommendation comes and, and many more opportunities for input. But, but I know it's less than satisfying to hear this range, but in, until we're saying, oh, we're, we're thinking about um, keeping these schools open and um, closing these sites in the meantime, we can't give you specific numbers, but we will when, when that recommendation is finalized. The rest. Oh, so the legislature needs to be a part of that solution. Um, So, 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 and we would very much like that assistance when we go make that ask. Again, Dr. Jones alluded to we're the only district in this part of the state that operates schools this small. It's difficult. It's it's not our strong. I, we we understand that we love the schools too, but they are they are inefficient. So as we're competing with other districts for that state funding, it is not the strongest hand for us to say, and we'd like you to provide that funding so we can subsidize schools with enrollment of 150, unlike every other state, uh, every other district in the state, no where there's like, yeah. So, so uh, I mean, a, again, we, we do need your help, and if, if subsidizing smaller schools is the most important thing, that, that's what we want to talk about. But yeah. in, in the end, we, we don't lead, it doesn't lead us to the comprehensive set of services at a neighborhood school that we've been talking about. It's, it's less efficient and it's less effective. Thank you. So we want to make sure that people who have asked questions have a chance to hear their questions heard. Absolutely. So the next question is, what will we do with empty buildings? And that's a question we hear quite a bit. So um, in the short term, we will keep our buildings in inventory. Again, this is site dependent on what our ultimate decisions are. Um, we understand that they're important community assets. We understand the green spaces around um, schools are important. So we would uh, work as possible with each neighborhood community to come up with an interim plan and then keep looking at our long range forecast to decide. So um, since our newer, more modern buildings have a capacity for more students and um, even with these 20 consolidations, we'll still only be at 85% capacity for elementary schools. Um, we don't believe, you know, over a longer haul of 40 years that we necessarily need all these buildings, um, but we want to keep many of them in inventory because Seattle is a growing community and some of these over some longer period of time need, may need to be reopened. And so we would plan for the interim uses, can, is this potential for a community center, is it potential for parks, are there community partners that might want to still use the building, but we will commit to keeping the buildings in good condition and making sure they re uh, remain assets in your community and that the green spaces are still available to neighborhoods. Thank you. And, and the next question, when schools are consolidated, how does the expensive cost of bus transportation factor in? So the state funds us um, uh, depending on the number of students who ride buses and the number of locations that they go to in the average distance. So, you know, the funding presumably would follow the students. Um, we would expect that we, um, we would have fewer um, destinations, but we would likely have more students traveling on buses. 
So we, we again, when we model this out, we find that there's a, a little bit of a savings because we are able to have more students on buses, but again, students are not by and large living further away from their schools. So what is the plan for under-resourced middle schools? That's a good one. My quick answer to that is, back to Olympia, the prototypical model also affects middle schools, and it's gonna affect middle schools hard. Here's a piece that I wanna concentrate on for just a second. Dr. Jones used the word stability and instability. The reality is we cannot stay where we are. There is no choice to say we wanna keep it the way it is. If we don't get funding and fixes, if we don't take care of ourselves in the short run, we will be forced to do one basic thing, and that is continue to cut programs and staff. It's the only option that we have. Uh, if we can keep all the buildings open, that would be wonderful, but to do that, if we stay where we are, and you saw the chart that Dr. Jones pointed at, that keeps us in the only option is to continue to cut people and programs. And that one hits middle schools. The next place we have to go if we have to cut additional staff will be at the high schools and the middle schools because that's the only place we have any staffing, for example, at the high school to fund some of our special programs that are not funded by the state and do what we do at our marvelous high schools. So the next step would be to cut back to basic contract minimum, and that will hit the secondary programs because we've tried to do everything possible at the elementaries and protect the staff and the programs. But I wanna emphasize, this is not stable. We cannot stay here. The next step is, that question is well-versed. Uh, what happens to the middle schools? What happens to the high schools? They will pay the price of having too many elementary schools, period. Thank you. Beyond enrollment size, what criteria will you consider when determining which schools to close? So in the presentation, there was a slide, and I know it was hard to, to read, but it had the, the criteria or the guiding principles. So when we think of creating um, schools that are well-resourced, we have to think about, first of all, the physical condition uh, of the building, and it's, it's the way that it's... Um, constructed to support the kind of teaching and learning that we is research-based and that we know is following best practice. Um, we fortunately uh, have an external group that has done an analysis, so we have some scores for building condition, which is some of the physical mechanical systems, structural systems, and then learning environment, which has to do with the configuration of, of learning spaces. Those reports you can see on our website, um, but we use those scores. We looked at the overall capacity of a building, so some of our buildings really could never, in their current state, um, become the, the size that gets us to where we think a school could sh and should be in order to provide what students need and deserve. Um, and then we look at the enrollment capacity. So as the building, we haven't, as, as we have said, uh, we're at 65% usage of our buildings right now. We are not filling our buildings. So the next question says, are we gonna have buildings that are bursting at the seams. No, we will have buildings that are actually at the size that they were built to, to contain, and that includes adding additional spaces so that every, every building will have those intensive um, special ed services, which is not the case right now. So um, those are the criteria. We looked at the regional need in terms of the number of buildings that are in each region for the number of students, and we did that all with 10 and 20 year projections. So there's the building itself, there's the enrollment, the number of students that are there to be in the building, there's the array of schools, making sure that those are distributed in a way so that all neighborhoods have access to schools. Um, so those are the key criteria that we've looked at. Anyone wanna add to that? And then will increasing school enrollment require physically increasing the size of school buildings and will there be portables? So again, where we have shared that we're um, operating schools, by and large, there are some exceptions, but um, overall, uh, not fully utilizing our capacity. It will not, we will actually be using our buildings as they are intended to be used. If you are keeping the buildings and paying to maintain them, how are you saving money without massive layoffs? So, 
you know, maintaining an occupied building um, is a lot different than maintaining a building um, just to take care of the building itself. That um, uh, you have to take out the trash, you have to mop the floors, you have to fix the plumbing, um, even if you only have 10 students in the building. And then all the other fixed costs that Dr. Buttleman talked about, uh, offering meal programs, having um, uh, supplies delivered from our warehouse, the number of sites matters. And those fixed costs is what we're trying to make um, more efficient. That um, just, uh, I think I used the example with the folks I was talking to, if you split your family in and had to support two houses, um, those costs are much different. And um, and it, it relates to the building being occupied and providing all the services to um, serve, an, whether it's uh, from security to custodial services to meal services, all the um, non-academic services it takes to keep a building open. That's where we're looking for savings. Thank you. And what are projections for elementary attendance, or I'm assuming enrollment as well, for the next five to 10 years? And how does this compare to current numbers? So again, we have an enrollment um, page on our website that has uh, some of the reports on enrollment. Um, we have, typically our enrollment reports have, a, have three lines that you can look at as sort of very conservative, a middle of the road, and then a more optimistic. But in all three of those, we envision attrition in terms of our enrollment that has to do with births in King County and looking at those. And then we also calculate, we have a kindergarten, um, we call it a kindergarten capture rate. So how, of those live births, what do we typically enroll at kindergarten that five years later? And then we also know grade over grade what the attrition rate is. So we can pretty much identify quite accurately what our enrollment will be. And all of those enrollment uh, factors have us losing enrollment. Um, we are also working closely with the City of Seattle and the Seattle Comprehensive Plan. We are aware of the housing um, that is being added to Seattle and are factoring that in as well. We worked with an organization called Flow, uh, which has done a lot of our capacity and demographic predictions uh, that work really closely with housing, um, housing stock in the city and housing that's coming into the city. And the kinds of units we know that where we tend to gain students from the different types of housing that are being built. So all of those things are taken into consideration when we make those um, projections. Yes. So that's an, that's an excellent question and I will make that as the last, maybe the last question. How do we get families to come back to Seattle Public Schools? Um, we absolutely see ourselves as uh, a public service. We are here to provide education and the best education we can for our students. We are most often thinking about our students who, um, for whom this is the school system they will go to um, and, and making sure that they have what they need and deserve as students, as citizens within our city, in our communities. Um, so our best bet is to create the strongest, healthiest schools we can, which is what we've shared with you tonight. Schools that have uh, all of the options, especially in elementary, music, art, PE, those electives that we know we want our students to have. That we have healthy, strong teaching teams at every grade level that are able to provide opportunities for support and extension for all of our students. Those are the things that we're going to do to make our schools strong. Um, moving into the future, those are the things we've been doing, but we're working closely with our instructional teams to make sure that our schools are providing the best possible education and supports. And I will pass it along to other folks. Yes. Yeah, so so that that's that's a that's a great question. Uh, we don't have a comprehensive alternative model. This and, and so if if there is a if there is a, a a a set of strategies that's comprehensive that recognizes our current state, our current instability, we are very interested. Uh, we're looking at this in in relation to urban districts across the country. We're all kind of faced with the same thing. No urban districts I know of have come up with a formula to be able to reconcile the instability that they're facing. And so we stay open. We want to be in partnership. We're, we're figuring out how to do that with you all. We're so glad that you're interested and you're passionate about this. 
right now, I have a bunch of smart folks here. I have, we have a bunch of smart folks in the city. There has not been an idea that's comprehensive enough to say, this is how we can proceed to bring stability, predictability, consistency. Uh, we, wanted, we want to disrupt business as usual and replace it with something better. If there is that comprehensive other idea alternative, we are all about that. And so we want to make sure we stay open to possibilities. There may be something that we haven't un, uh, unearthed, but at this point in time right now, this frankly is our best thinking. And this is, this is the way we're going to get to, I believe, stability. And it's not necessarily getting us to the perfect state. It's just getting us sustained for the next, for the next several years. So I just want to say uh, thank you all. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious, and I hope you all can give us feedback around uh, those of you who went to the uh, session that we had on Tuesday at Roosevelt. If this is a better format, let, let us know. We're trying to be responsive and trying to make sure we are honoring your all's concerns, wants, wishes, desires, needs, fears, and, and we know that change is we know that change is difficult. But we're here. We're in it. Uh, trust us. If there was another way to go about this, we would we would pursue it because we know how uh, challenging this is, and how much it's going to disrupt uh, our routines and our, our consistency. But I think at the end of the day. It's going to be, be our district is going to be better be because of it. And so uh, I just want to recognize a few folks really quickly. I, I know my staff is here. I just want to give a shout out. Anybody who's a SPS staff, please raise your hand. Th thank you for what you do. All, all these folks that raised their hand are part of the team that's working on this. Uh, and we also have a couple of uh, current board members and former board members in here. Re please raise your hands. We're going to recognize you. And so. Between you all, us, we're in this together, and I'm just hopeful that you all will have faith in us to, to come up with the best, the best alternative, if there is one. For right now, we're, we're all in on this, and our board, our board will give us guidance around our next steps, but we're going to keep you all engaged a, along the way. And so that's our goal, and if there's ways that we can improve in terms of engaging you all, let us know. So that's, that's, that's where we are. So Bev, I know you, you have us on a clock and I, I want to uh, give you the opportunity to close us out. Thank you very much. And before I pass it uh, to Chief Redmond, um, we will be updating our frequently asked questions on our website based on these questions. We want to be responsive. So on your way out, we have some folks from our um, public affairs team that can hand you QR codes that will take you directly to the FAQ portion of our website. We will be updating as we process these questions and hopefully be able to provide even more detailed responses. So thank you for, for being here and for asking your questions. Thank you all again for traversing traffic, for coming here. I know how important this conversation is to you. Again, thank you for tolerating our tweaks to make this a better experience for you. We are on our way next. This conversation moves to Chief Self on Saturday morning. So we will be engaging there, having this similar conversation. So thank you again. You also have an email from me. Remember, I said this was not about the technology piece, but if you have other thoughts, there is a link inside of that email that takes you to an idea exchange or that thought exchange where you can leave some additional comments. I want you all to be safe. Thank you so much for giving us your time. We really, really do appreciate it.